Please rise. Court is now in session. All rise. All rise. Is it legal to? A regular look at the legal system and you, a special production of the Missouri Bar. I'm Bob Pretty. And I'm Farah Fight. We're wired together in today's society by technology that changes every day. In fact, the two of us are not anywhere close to one another. But each change brings challenges. What's the proper way to use this new technology? What are the limits to the way we use it? See, or it seems the way it uses us. There are other issues too. Joining us to talk about those questions and many others is Anjali Dooley, who chairs the Missouri Bar's Technology and Innovation Committee. She's practiced law for almost 20 years and is the managing partner of the Innovators Law Firm in St. Louis. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Farah. Thank you, Bob. Anjali, it seems that the laws and regulations are always trying to catch up to technological change. Is that an accurate perception? Absolutely. Um, Technology moves faster than the laws can catch up. So it's always a constant, um, I would say, almost like uh, uh, running in the Olympics, you know, and you're trying to catch up with the person that's in front of you, but they're just way too fast. So technology is um, definitely moving way faster in every industry that we can think about. I focus my industry on healthcare and healthcare technology companies mostly. However, I talk about legal tech. I, um, you know, talk about um, uh, financial technology companies. Everybody is moving faster, quicker. Um, How can I do things better? Disruptors. And I represent these type of companies. So this is really a, a hot button topic, especially in healthcare. I suppose a lot of people uh, run into problems because they don't understand the terms of service of whatever service they're using. And, and, you know, every now and then when I get on the Internet and I want to do something, I get this long, small print document that they ask me to click on and say, I approve. I never read the things. Uh, is that a danger to people uh, who, who use this technology? Sure. For the consumer. So, um Unfortunately or fortunately, whatever you want, what other lawyers are thinking or the public is thinking, I draft these (laughs) for companies is the terms of use and privacy policies. So in explaining terms of use, what is a terms of use or T-O-U? S sometimes with the lowercase or T O U we call them. Um, and sometimes they also come across as terms and conditions of using a technology platform or a social media site. So what is a terms of use or a terms of use agreement that you're scrolling through and you say, I accept and agree. Basically it's a contract. What does that contract say? Well, it's usually between a technology company or social me- media company and, um, and the host and the user, meaning the consumer. And the terms of use detail the requirements, the standards and limitations of use in navigating the technology platform or social media. And then you're like, well, I know how to use this. Well, why do I need to sign this? And what is the purpose of the terms of use? The purpose of a terms of use is to provide a framework to terminate or restrict the user, the consumer, usually, to access to the technology or social media platform when the terms have been violated. Do you think you could make it simpler and shorter and easier for people like me to understand? Sure. We, in fact, in my the companies that I represent, I try to make it in plain English and not this this um, legalese, as we call it, and and what everything that a consumer is agreeing to. So in simple layman terms, what terms of use are is how can a consumer use this platform? That's basically it. So is it important to read through? Yes, it is important to read through because then the consumer knows, well, this is how I can use the platform and this is what happens to me if I violate the company's terms of use. I can be thrown off the platform, I can violate. So we've been talking a lot about uh, Twitter, for example. Twitter has a terms of use, 
right? It's a social media company. You can tweet, you can do stuff. But if you're violating their terms of use, saying you're putting um, language on or video on Twitter that is unacceptable to their terms, then you can be kicked off. Same thing with YouTube. Thing, same thing with any other social media company. Uh, but it is, they have all these policies that they have in place that you can, um, you have to agree to as a consumer on, I promise to, to agree to use the platform in a certain way. So basically, it's a contract between you and whatever company uh, is issuing this technology to you. Correct. Correct. Uh, so I know that you mentioned that you work a lot in the healthcare related field. And I remember just, you know, maybe like 10 years ago, if I would ask a medical provider, oh, do you have electronic medical records? Not everyone did, but now it's commonplace. Right. Um, what are some things that folks should consider when, uh, you know, agreeing to either share, you know, their medical records with another family member or someone else. I know that there's always a form that you can say, oh, I want you to share right. this information with others. Um, and also just in general, um, is, is there anything that uh, the average patient should know about electronic medical records, um, risks and or rewards? So, okay, uh, a lot of people uh, get confused on what terms of use are and what privacy policies are. So terms of use, as we said, is how to use the platform and how can you, you know, you, uh, how the platform um, can't, you can violate terms of the, the contract between you and the technology company. But privacy policies, which are often incorporated into a terms of use, so can, is basically separate, but and accomplish a different facet of data use and data governance. And I know those are big terms, data use and data governance, but it's how privacy policies is how can the technology company use your private information, a name, social security number sometimes, whatever it is, date of birth, and how it is governed and what laws govern the use of your data. So in healthcare, for example, everybody goes to HIPAA and how does HIPAA, how, how are privacy policies in HIPAA um, used? So it's very confusing to the normal layperson on HIPAA, but not, it's not only HIPAA and that's a lot of companies and especially smaller tech healthcare tech companies. You also have to look at state laws and state laws are different than HIPAA. They often um, parallel HIPAA or, or similar to HIPAA, but some are very strict. For example, California is very strict. New York is very strict. So privacy policies are incorporated into terms of use, but they're different than terms of use and what do privacy policies protect right they protect and limit how a company can use your personal information and there's personal identifiable information pii and there is personal health information phi so for example in privacy policy protections may include limitation on whose data may be gathered for example no children under 16, um, what information they consider confidential and what information is considered confidential under state and federal law. How, this is a big one, how that company is going to secure and protect your information, especially your health information. So when you asked about the EHR, for example, well, when you agree to their terms of use and you have their notice of privacy practices and you agree to the notice of privacy practices and you agree that, you know, you're going to input this information that could going into the the doctor is going to gather the information and it's going to go into the EHR, 
they agree that they're going to protect your information. So the company is saying that we will protect your information because you're putting it into this platform. They also say how, especially in healthcare companies and HIPAA, requires on how to tell you that they're going to de-identify that information, like put a number, a random number around your information. So that, so if that, that information is breached, all the breach hacker would get is this de-identified number and they won't get your social security number and they won't get your name. So how are they de-identifying that information? Um, they also have to tell you in the privacy policy how your information is being stored and for how long is it being stored. And again, there's federal law and there's state law on storage. So uh, companies have to tell you how long that they're going to keep that information. We often say to use the most strictest standards for our companies and the strictest standards are in California. So we try to accommodate the strictest state without burdening the company to um, um, comply to comply with the strict uh, strictest state laws. Um, they also have to tell you how information is destroyed following the required retention period. So if they have to keep re medical records for seven years, in this platform, they also have to tell you, well, how are we going to destroy this information after the seven years? And then often you have to get a security risk assessment and what are the security requirements behind keeping the data? How, what are the security risk requirements in transferring the data? And how like the EHR, for example, is get, it, it gets into the, say you go to the doctor's office, the information, the doctor uses the EHR. He puts that information into the EHR. The EHR might be connected to also a hospital system. So how is that EHR going to be transferring that data to another hospital system or to another physician? Or how is that data being transferred? So that that is also part of the terms of use and privacy policies. So I know that was a long-winded and um, complicated area of the law, but I'm trying to explain it in simple terms on, hey, it's important for a consumer to read not only the terms of use, but the privacy policies of a social media platform, of their inputting information in telemedicine. That's what I do all day long right now. What are the terms of use of the, the doctor that you're seeing online or the nurse you're seeing online? You enter on a Zoom platform and how are they protecting your information? Are they protecting your information? Are they using a HIPAA compliant platform? Does it matter if they're using a HIPAA compliant platform? What state are they in? There are so many things that go around that. So what I try to do on my end is protect the company in line with consumer protection laws and who governs all of this are not only states, but the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Communications Commission, and the H, uh, HHS, OIG, for healthcare entities. So you have a lot of agencies and government regulators involved in how your information is protected and how to use technology. This sounds like a good time for a segment we call Legalese with retired Supreme Court Judge Mike Wolf. Legalese, that means we ask Judge Wolf to translate the lawyer's language into English. Judge? Legalese. How many of us have actually read the disclosures on our cell phone contract or other technology devices? Some are quite long, but the plot... Oh, wait a minute, there is no plot. Don't get me started. When it comes actually to reading these, I've often suspected that the last person to have read my cell phone contract may well have been the lawyer who wrote it. It was refreshing to hear today's podcast lawyer urging our listeners to read their contracts. Good idea, but let's face it. Very few of us will take that advice. These contracts have replaced insurance policies as the unreadable book of the month club. 
Insurance companies under the thumb of regulators and some consumer advocates did attempt some years ago to write their contracts in, quote, plain English, close quote. I am not sure that helped much. An old friend who has since passed from the scene was Professor Vincent Immel of St. Louis U Law School. He taught contracts and his students by and large revered him. For the first time in the lives of many of them, Immel was a teacher who demanded the students use the right words and pronounce them correctly. When the plain English movement took hold, Immel was skeptical. He told me that he read plain English contracts, then translated them into complicated legalese so that he could understand them. His point was that plain English was intended to make things simpler, but in reality, the writers often used the wrong or an imprecise word. So it confused him, hence the translation to the old words. Another brilliant former colleague, Charlie Blackmar, professor at St. Louis U and later a Missouri Supreme Court judge, was in the No Read Club. Some years ago, Judge Blackmar sat with us on the Supreme Court to replace a judge who was unable to participate in deciding a case. It was an insurance case where a careful reading of the contract, the insurance policy, was called for. From the bench, retired Judge Blackmar deadpanned, I've never actually read an insurance contract unless, of course, I was being paid to do so. So these days, technology gives us these contracts online to read and either to agree, which means I can get the product or service I want, or disagree, in which case I can look elsewhere. There does not seem to be a place for me to negotiate the terms of the deal. In recent years, I get notices that someone has read my contracts from years gone by. They are the class action lawyers. Bless them. They not only have read these terms, but figured out when the company may not be delivering the service that the contract called for. And with this happens to a large number of people, including you and me, we can participate, or not, as members of a class who will get notice of the suit and presumably of the settlement that may bring us some compensation for our trouble. Today's discussion also gets us into the realm of privacy. Those of us whose economic and maybe personal lives or live partly or mostly online, probably have no idea how much information is out there on our consumer and other preferences. Suppose you go online to look for car rentals or hotels in a city you plan to travel to. Often I would get a barrage of emails after I had entered this search offering the same product or service. Or you're placing an order online, and before and after you pay, you get information about other products, sometimes with the tagline, Customers who ordered this item also brought these items. And the political ads, don't get me started. If you make one donation to a candidate you know and care about, you may hear from candidates from all over the country, people you do not know or care about. You'd be happy to share with them, of course, but not until you win the Powerball, a chance that is somewhere between zero and one in 330 million. Those of us who live part of our economic lives online are fearful that someone will steal our data or, worse, our identity. That may sound bad, and it is, but it's also an opportunity for someone to make money selling us protection. No, no, not the kind that organized crime offers in the movies and sometimes in real life, but more like an insurance policy. So why buy insurance? Because it makes us feel better, safer. What if it does not pay when you suffer a loss? Well, you had your insurance. It did make you feel safer, didn't it? So you got something for your premium. Am I right? But still, we are in the unregulated Wild West online. Platforms that bring us this onslaught of activity are, for now, held exempt from liability for passing along misinformation, libel, and other online assaults. Congress is getting a lot of advice about changing that, so stay tuned. The question about regulating these online activities comes down to a simple question. Are we better off with some regulation or with the Wild West of little or no regulation. So far, the public has not effectively demanded the helping hand of government. There are, of course, online protectors who would claim to be more effective than governmental regulators. Well, we'll see. For now, the major actors in the Wild West are spending many millions of dollars in lobbying and lawyer fees to keep the regulating wolves from their doors. There, of course, is a cost to consumers where there is no regulation and a cost to consumers for regulating. Consumers ultimately pay these costs. 
Is it more effective to spread those costs through, throughout society as tax supported regulation does? Or is it more effective to let entrepreneurs sell us protection from other entrepreneurs to keep us from being victimized online? The answer is, I don't know. Do you? It may depend on how recently you got ripped off. Right now, as a consumer, I'm feeling pretty good. Tomorrow may be different. Should we all be a bit wary? Or should we be very afraid? This is Mike Wolf, tech supporter, tech victim. Tech your pick. Legal ease. Does this, this lengthy document in any way hold the company above any liability in case information is misused? Sure. It depends. So don't you love that answer? It's the, <laughs> We the... hear that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends, right? So it depends on if the consumer signs this broad, vague terms of use of privacy policies, the vaguer the language, the easier it is for the company to get out of it. But also you have to look at consumer protection laws and, um, Usually companies, obviously companies that are coming to me want to comply, right? They want to comply with the laws that are either state, federal, all of it. They want to make sure they're in compliance. So for my job on a regular basis is to look at data privacy uh, laws throughout all 50 states, because some of my companies are in all 50 states. Um, make sure they're complying with state laws and also make sure they're complying with whatever consumer protection laws there are. For example, how there's a telephonic consumer protection act. So when you get that phone call from scam callers, you know, and you want to be placed on a no call list, what is that? You know, you can press a button. They're supposed to require you to be placed on a no call list. So the Missouri Attorney General's office is going to be looking that at, at these scam calls. So I don't think anybody is above the law in this sense, if that's the question, nobody's above the law, but sometimes it takes time because the company can say, well, we have these privacy policies in terms of use, the consumer signed it, and we're just, we, we let them know, well, yeah, but if you let them know, but you're still in violation of state or federal law, you're still in violation of state and federal law. So it can take some time to go through the system. If, if um, companies think that they're above the law, they're not above the law. And that's why companies that I represent anyway, seek my counsel in making sure that they're in compliance. Is it likely that the average person and including myself and Bob in this, that are that we are participating in some type of technology where we have agreed to a terms of service and have no idea who they're sharing our information with. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> how does uh, how does Amazon know what you want to buy? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so most people do not read the terms of service or the privacy policies and cookies. I, I forgot to add cookies. Let's talk about cookies for a minute. Cookies disclosure. So on not the, web the delicious kind that we bake at home, but no, the not tech the kind. <laughs> yeah, not the, not, not the cookie monster cookies or the cookies, but the cookies, cookies disclosures. So if, if, for example, a company is a tech company and they're a service provider and they, they have to disclose in their terms of use how they track your information. For example, are you clicking on the website and once you click on their website, they can track your IP address, right? Where did this person come from, right? Um, Google Analytics. They, they've, they've signed up. They have to disclose that we are part of Google Analytics and so we track your data. You have to agree to that, right? Or you shut down the site. So you say, I accept cookies, that little pop-up that comes up on your screen, yes. right? You accept it. Nobody has time to read about this, right? So 
um, either you're on the internet or you're not on the internet. So a lot of people um, track. There are companies that make it a fact that they don't track cookies. We don't keep data, and they clearly write that on your on their their um, terms of use, privacy policies, and the different website terms of use and website privacy policies. If I can go back and talk a little bit about that, the website terms of use and a website pri privacy policy is different than the privacy policy in terms of use once you download a technology app or once you get into a patient portal, if we're talking about healthcare, right? And right. you're inputting information. So we draft, hey, terms of use and privacy policies for the website, which is used mostly for marketing. And then you have the terms of use and privacy policies once you get into a patient portal or once you download that app and you agree to the terms of the app. That's very different than than uh, the privacy. So people are using technology. Let's remember, people are using technology for convenience, right? Everything's convenient. I use Amazon because it's convenient. I have a daughter in college. I can send her stuff. I can send myself stuff. I get, during the pandemic, we got our groceries delivered to us. Um, uh, we got our prescription medication delivered to us. Uh, we saw our doctors online. Uh, we see our lawyers online, you know, through Zoom. Um, we've had, and even with all the Zoom meetings, you accepted, when you downloaded Zoom onto your laptop, you accepted the, uh, the terms of use of Zoom and the privacy policies of Zoom, right? Yes. So, I so, feel like now that we can do all this, it's going to be part of our lives going forward. Yeah, and it's part of your lives and it's part of moving forward. Um, and nobody reads them. I draft them. Nobody reads them. <laughs> yeah, that's really dis disappointing. But, you know, we do we try to protect the companies, but we also, you know, guide the companies in protecting the consumer and consumers information and making sure that they're doing all the right things, right? Um, so, so from a compliance end. But that being said, um, nobody reads them, but we have laws in place because nobody reads them, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. The laws are there as kind of a backstop to protect right. yes. the consumer and outline what the responsibilities are of the businesses. Right. Right. Now, what if, if my information, if there's a breach and my information is made available, whether it's through a financial company um, that might be the most alarming or scary to someone right off the bat, um, what should I expect? Or should I go back to my terms of service or terms of use and see if it was outlined in there what the company will do to right. try to make me whole again? Right. Well, it depends on what the terms of use is, right? So is how many people's data was breached, right? So recently, for example, T-Mobile, uh, I think 40 million users' data was breached by T-Mobile carrier. Uh, they had to notify the consumer and all. So when I log in to pay my bill, right, they notify me. It's required by the government regulations to notify the consumer. The, and they have to notify the consumer of what their options are to report if their data has been breached or not, or if they had any activity. Then there might be a lawsuit against the company if they didn't take care and go, you know, if they were negligent in taking care of the data, if they didn't put play, things in place that they were supposed to put in place. Um, if they didn't do a security risk analysis, uh, which is an analysis of how they're keeping the data secure and comply with national standards and maybe have to go above and beyond the national standards that are required to keep the data secure. 
Um, did they have a fire wallet? There's so many factors that go into place, you know, how was this data hacked and things like that. So, um, that's why on both sides, when a company's as contacts me, for example, of, Hey, uh, we had a hundred patient records breached. Okay. Do I disclose, do I have to self-disclose this to the government? Yes or no. You know, usually it's 500 records or more. Uh, you know, there's different types of levels of disclosure and self-disclosure and did you disclose and uh, things that, um, that are required by the regulations and laws that are in place. So um, companies have to comply with that and they have to notify the consumer if they've realized that their data, the consumer's data has been breached. They have to notify the consumer on how to get, either make them whole or what they're doing to um, fix the problem and what is the next steps. And if they don't do that, and um, there's lawsuits behind, um, uh, you know, privacy policy breaches. Aetna had one recently, it has nothing to do with technology, but they mailed information to wrong people on um, HIV status, right? And they had a huge, huge breach. Um, T-Mobile just had a breach. Cambridge, during the election cycle, we saw Cambridge a Analytica and Facebook, they had a breach. These are all ongoing, probably lawsuits, settlements, things that are going on that we, we, we don't see what's going on in the background necessarily, but, you know, attorneys on both sides are working to fix fix the issue and it's not only the attorneys we i partner very much so with the technology officers of companies i partner definitely with uh, you know um the clinical directors because i'm in healthcare so clinical directors and documentation and how they're what is the workflow behind that so it takes a lot of people to get some of these problems fixed and it takes a lot of people, not only the lawyers, but the business folks and the tech folks to make sure that consumer data is protected. I've heard, um, you know, national level security experts say that it's not a question of if your data, if your identity or data will be breached at some point, it's, it's more or less when. Yes, um, that's true. What are some tips that you have, you know, again, um, for John Q Public, uh, if we know this is going to happen at some point, what are some things that I can do on an individual basis to maybe protect or be prepared for this? Um, that's a good question. And I don't really know because, it, I mean, I do know certain basic things of like, don't put input in, in, Read one, read the terms of use and privacy policies, but two, start there. But um, if you don't understand something, ask questions to the company. You know, they have a chat box uh, sometimes. That may not be as helpful as really realizing that you are just having the realization that you're putting in this information, right? So, for example, let me give you an example of an automobile company, okay? So they can track. Automobiles now have chips. There's a chip shortage or whatever. It's not like the old days. So, you know, you're buying an automobile, you're buying a, let's say a used car, you have your Volvo. I have a Volvo. So like when, let me go back. I have a vehicle and, and in that vehicle, you have put in your cell phone information because you want to be able to use Bluetooth and you have your Apple CarPlay, and you have all the information. So when I bought my vehicle, for example, I bought a one-year-old vehicle from a dealer. Uh, the person that used that vehicle before didn't erase the information from their Bluetooth. So I know exactly who's been using the, who, the name of the person that had the vehicle before me, right? Oh, wow. Yeah, you know, 
So, so you think about that, right? Just think about little things like that. Your vehicle is tracking, right? Your insurance company is tracking. If you want a discount on your insurance, on your auto insurance, right? Is putting a tracking device in your, your vehicle, say, Hey, use this tracker and we can track you. And, um, and that way we know how safe you're driving right? And that will give you a 5% discount on your insurance. Okay, but they actually know how you drive, when you drive, where you drive, where you're going, you're going, you know, so they can track you, right? So say you're thinking about a divorce case, this is all going to come together, right? And it's a divorce case, that that attorney, if he's smart, and says, hey, my spouse is going to be seen with so and so, and they can track that person's whereabouts with their device that's in their car or within the car, their smart car itself, right? We track our kids. I don't, but my daughter's gone to college, but I know like uh, I didn't get Life 360, but every parent did that I know. And when my child was in high school, they're saying, we need, we want to know exactly where our child is. Well, in 19... you know, 80 when I was growing up and <laughs> nobody tracked me. My parents did not know where I was. Right. But right. I, I just had to call in or be home by a certain time. time. Right. So, but that's also requires terms of use and tracking data. So if you realize there's a statistic out there, right. Um, the amount of data we are producing each day is staggering by 2025 the proliferation of data presuming devices and services means that each person with an internet connected device will have at least one data interaction sending or receiving from a continually expanding universe of such devices every 18 second or almost 5,000 times per day so you're sharing your data 5,000 times per day or more. That that gets us straight into the whole issue of privacy. Uh, there is that sounds like there's no privacy whatsoever if I'm sitting here using my computer. Even if I just look at my email or if I go to Google and I look up uh, if I want to play some music off of YouTube or something, uh, if somebody somebody knows I'm doing that. If, has 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 the have we lost all sense of privacy? Um. I think that if you're if you're a normal person, I would say we've lost a lot of privacy. Okay, there are tech. Uh, I'm not one of them, um, but there are tech uh, people that you know you can register and go on a website where <coughs> it's private browsing, so they're not tracking your browsing history, they're not tracking what you're what you're buying. But if you have a connected home. If you have a connected, for example, I have a connected home. I use Alexa and Google. Okay. So Alexa knows what I need. (laughs) I mean, I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's a convenience, right? So we're giving up privacy. If you think about it for convenience. So are you willing to give up the privacy for your convenience or are you not? You know, I don't remember if you guys recall this movie enemy of the state. It's with Will Will Smith and Gene Hackman. And they're like, everybody's, tra- yeah, you can be tracked very easily nowadays. So, so with your cell phone, with your location, with your car, with what you ordered from Alexa, yes, you're giving up privacy for technology and convenience. So are you willing to do that? Most consumers are saying, yes, I'm willing to do that as long as I'm protected and I'm not getting a my credit score is not going down for being hacked. Those are the things that we worry about, right? Um, When your credit card information and your social security number is being hacked. And so hackers can open up credit cards and all these kind of things. And those are very hard to correct nowadays. So be very careful when you're putting in your information in websites clear out your browsing history often every 30 days you can set it on auto clear clear out your cookies every 30 days i would say if not more 
even on your phone, you can clear out your browsing history. You can clear out every app that you have, your data history on your app. I often do that. You don't have to share your location. So now they ask on apps when you download them, for example, on all Google Maps or whatever is allow once, allow while using app, never allow, right? Sharing your location. So you decide as a consumer, do I want this app to know where I'm at or not? I don't want all apps to know where I'm at at all times. I don't want my kids to know where I'm at at all times, <laughs> right? Like, so, yeah. so my kids don't want me to know where they're at, but they share their location with me because I have an Apple iPhone, but I don't necessarily share my location with them. I do, but, but that's, that's because they're my family, but not like on Snapchat. Kids are on Snapchat, right? And they share their location with all their friends on where they're at that day. So I think there's good things about that, but there's bad things about that. And the good thing is that I know where my child is when she's getting into an Uber. I know where my child is and their friends know where they are. And should something happen, I can give this information to the police and say, hey, this is the last known location I, I know where she's been. So there are some good things that, uh, come out of, uh, of this. And it's how much privacy you want versus how much, again, convenience you want and how much information as a consumer you want to share. But know that there's laws in protecting the consumer should the company be negligent in securing your data. You can share your data, right? But how is the company negligent in securing your data? There's laws to protect the consumer on that. And it sounds like we're sharing, we're choosing to share our data more and more right. to the point, like you said, up to 5,000 instances by what, 2025? Yeah, per day. Yeah. Or more. So, and I'm sure I'm sharing my data way more than that right now as we speak. So every time you input information, realize that this company is collecting that information. Data is the most valuable resource. In healthcare, for example, every company is trying to gather data so we can get better. So they say, at least, that we can have better patient outcomes in healthcare, right? So we're trying to say, okay, our, you know, every little piece of information we can gather and, and collect that means we we are provide we're we're hopefully going to help that patient be healthier, right? However, that's not necessarily the case every single time. Sometimes they just want to know what drugs to sell you. Sometimes they want to know, you know, uh, what medical devices that this person needs. But we're trying to make the person help. Most companies are trying to do the right thing and make that person healthier and look at the whole person. We're nowhere near that right now because in healthcare and technology, we're so fragmented. And I, I don't know what industry is not fragmented yet, but I think um, the best industry, fintech, I think is really moving forward in incorporating um, technology use and communicating with other financial institutions on hey, transfer of monies and things like that. For example, Venmo is very interesting to me because it has issues where um, you can send money, you can hook up your bank account or credit card to Venmo and everybody's Venmoing or cash apping their friends like, hey, uh, you know, to share bills. But in Venmo, if I don't know if anybody has used Venmo that I'm t uh, in the audience, but everybody is sharing why they're sending this other person money, you know? Yes, I've seen it. You know, everyone puts yeah, their right. yeah, babysitting like, or yeah. purchase their drinks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, but why? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I put mine on private, right? So if I'm paying my handyman through Venmo, you don't know that I'm paying my handyman through Venmo and for what? I don't want everybody to know what I'm paying for, you know? that I got my refrigerator fixed or whatever, you know? <laughs> so, so it's very interesting, but it seems that more and more consumers, especially people under 50 and younger and more, somebody maybe even older than 50, want to share this information. 
you know, I, I get the impression that it, it apparently isn't a big problem. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I haven't seen any television commercials yet for any law firm asking to file a lawsuit on behalf of everybody for information breaches. Uh, there's all kinds of medical things that people are filing lawsuits for and that law firms are enticing people through their television ads to to file suit on. But I have yet to see a single lawyer ad saying, hire us and we'll file a lawsuit against these people who've been collecting your information. Is this a, is this a prospective new field for the legal profession? Well, I think there's lawsuits already for HIPAA breaches, right, of information. So um, th there, there's already plaintiffs' attorneys that, you know, um, um, are filing lawsuits for tech technology use and HIPAA breaches, whether they're paper or, or um, te technology-related uses. I think there's going to be more and more lawsuits in this area and they're they're coming down the pipeline one of the only cases that happened in 2018 is carpenter v the united states and this kind of indirectly deals with the terms of use uh uh it does limit who may access data data when it's gathered when using a service such as google maps uh which again you can say passively and continuously monitors a person's location when you say allow once allow uh, while using the app or never allow so this this case carpenter v the united states which happened in 2018 this case held the government officials including police must obtain a warrant before accessing a person's cell phone location data the court found that where detailed location data offered near perfect surveillance, the Fourth Amendment protects this information as sensitive. This ultimately sets the precedent for protecting sensitive user data for warrantless government seizure. So in criminal cases, I think you're going to see more and more um, uh, cases around protection of, of privacy privacy protections and Fourth Amendment protections. But overall civil cases, we haven't seen it to the as except I feel more so in the medical area. Um, more so, I think there's going to uh, I mean, there obviously has been cases um, in fin, uh, uh, financial institutions, as well as now telecom, you know, telecommunications institutions, but those often deal with more of like, they are going ahead and paying the government fines and things and then taking corrective actions to secure data versus pay a consumer lawsuit against the company, you know. Speaking of lawsuits, I've noticed, and I, I know I've heard this uh, reported as well, that uh, just in contracts in general, and I suspect that it's also in your terms of use, that oftentimes when signing that contract, you're agreeing to forego your right to a trial and instead enter mediation or arbitration. That is, is in that... fact correct. <laughs> I put those and, clauses in all the time. <laughs> and, and what does that mean? What does that mean for the average the average user? If, if they are disgruntled or if there's been a breach, does that mean that they can't sue then? The, it depends. Again, it depends on the mediation arbitration clause and how you can get out of that clause. Um, and it, sometimes it depends on what it is for exactly in the contracts that is breached. It's not necessarily all terms can be mediated or arbitrated. So um, for the consumer, if they've signed something like that and they have to read it through, it's better to go to a consumer protection company or agency first and say, hey, I signed this, what does this mean? And can I get a lawyer that does consumer protection laws uh, that handles these type of cases? And, and can I pursue this action uh, or sue in court and and not and and get out of the arbitration or mediation clause. So there there are ways to do that, 
but I think it it's um, usually the case is that you can't now. Of course, there's class action attorneys that do this all day long, and they they figure out how to get out of those clauses, and it becomes a class action. And if it becomes a class action, then you get a little card in the mail that says, hey, you're entitled to five dollars, you know, Got it. or a Best Buy gift card or whatever it is that, right. you know, that that was breached or a T-Mobile, you know, you get five dollars off your T-Mobile bill, you know, or whatever it is, you know. So I think one of the breaches that I saw with the financial institution, I think they offered a. Uh, credit monitoring or right, something of right, that nature. Right. Yeah. Credit monitoring is often a, a good one. So so there's a lot of different ways to get out of this, but we put them in there. So it's it's we just a company doesn't get frivolous lawsuits filed against them at all times. Okay. You know? And so when the company does get a disgruntled customer, then that customer has a method to the madness of contacting the company and saying, hey, this is how they're done. One of the things that privacy policies and terms of use are required is to say, who do I contact should my information be breached? Or should I feel that you're not complying with the terms of use? So often with companies, I tell them when we're drafting them, who's your PO point of contact and who wh who's going to get the compliance at such and such company.com you know who can i email who what's the phone number i can contact because i have to report this and you the consumer says i tried to contact the company and i emailed them they never got back then you have a record of going to consumer protection attorney or going to the uh, state ag's office and saying look i've tried all ways to do this and this company is is not getting back to me and now what do i do so okay. you have next steps, right? Next I know time. it's, it's, I feel I just blurted out a lot of information and, <laughs> and it's, it's complicated because it's technology, but at the same time, if anybody has questions, I feel free to contact me. I'm not a consumer protection um, lawyer but I can also advise on where that person should go should, should something happen to their information. Or what, where do they look, where to look, where's a good starting point to look on what they signed and what does that mean to them? Well, I think you've done a great job of pulling back the curtain <laughs> of those uh, I accept yeah. buttons, <laughs> which I know I've been guilty of not reading. Sometimes I read, sometimes I don't. Right. Sometimes I read portions and then I get tired of scrolling. Right. Um, so I think this has been an eye opener, I know for me and hopefully for our listeners. Right. Again, I just want to reiterate what reading in those, the terms of use and privacy policies, what you really want to know is how's your information being gathered and how are they protecting that information and what are they doing with that information and who are they sharing that information with? So those are the few things that you really want to scroll through when you're scrolling going, Hey, where do I find what they're doing with my information? Right. And what information are they collecting? And, and who are they sharing it with if they're sharing it with anybody right so that you just want to know that and and companies are supposed to put that in plain english sometimes in bold letters i often do that so it's it's easy to find and i have tried to make the policies very non legalese so a consumer can understand what that means and I love being on this. This is a great podcast. I can't wait to when this one comes out, but also, you know, listening to the other ones that I've been on. And again, our thanks to Anjali Dooley with the Innovation Law Firm in St. Louis. Before we go, this program series is going to be focusing on a lot of our basic individual rights to shed some light on the U.S. Constitution and the rights we have under it. Here's the Missouri Bar Citizenship Education Director, Tony Simons, to tell us more. Sometimes the Constitution is precisely on point and has direct applicability to a given issue. If we're talking about freedom of speech, then the First Amendment is where we turn. If we're discussing the validity of a congressional action, 
then Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution is where we would start. On the subject of technology and the issues raised in today's podcast, the applicability of the Constitution is not quite so readily identifiable. The word that was repeated many times throughout this podcast was privacy. Here's where it gets tricky. Nowhere in the Constitution will you find the words right to privacy. However, it is undeniable that privacy mattered to those who crafted the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment protects the rights of individuals to choose their religious beliefs, a very private matter. The Third Amendment prohibited the placement of soldiers into the privacy of people's homes. The Fourth Amendment's prohibition of unreasonable searches and seizures is designed to keep people's homes, papers, and effects private and free from unwarranted government intrusion. The Fifth Amendment forbids forcing individuals to incriminate themselves, a protection of information that they want to keep private from the government. Additionally, the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause has been viewed by some members of the court to include a right of privacy. So, privacy was important to those who drafted the Constitution and to many of the justices who have served on the Supreme Court. However, judges, commentators, and other experts continue to differ on whether there is an actual constitutional right of privacy. Regardless of this difference of opinion on whether there exists such a right, our constitutional system nevertheless offers a mechanism by which privacy concerns can be addressed and protected. The framers of the Constitution created a system in which the people's elected representatives could enact legislation on issues that mattered to the people. In recent decades, as technology has developed and advanced, The people demanded that their elected representatives enact laws protecting the privacy of individuals. Examples of these laws include the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Privacy Act of 1974, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, the Financial Monetization Act, and the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. Despite this impressive array of laws passed by legislative bodies, as today's podcast demonstrates, we continue to have legitimate concerns about the protection of our privacy. Once again, the Constitution offers a way of addressing this problem. If we believe the laws we have now do not go far enough in protecting our privacy, we can advocate for even stronger laws providing even more protection for the people. In addition, the framers of the Constitution gave us an even more powerful tool if we believed that legislation was inadequate to provide the necessary solution. We have the ability to amend the Constitution. Article 5 gives us a two-step procedure in which an amendment is proposed by either two-thirds of Congress or a constitutional convention, followed by a vote of three-fourths of the states. It is not an easy task. In fact, the framers made it difficult to amend the Constitution because they did not want it to be changed on a frequent or frivolous basis. However, they made it possible to amend the Constitution to address matters of great importance upon which a strong consensus existed. Privacy could be one of those compelling issues that might give rise to the level of support required to amend the Constitution. Before we embark upon the path of seriously speculating about amending the Constitution, though, it might be useful for us to bear in mind an important aspect of the Constitution. The Constitution was designed to be an instrument of limited government. It is there to protect our freedom, not necessarily to protect us from ourselves. What's the relevance of this observation to our topic today? We have made the decision as individuals and as a society to inject ourselves into and to voluntarily participate in 
the magical world of technology. Some would suggest that the Constitution protects the ability of companies to develop technology and to offer their wares to the public, which can then choose whether to partake of that technology. These same people would likely suggest that the answer to this problem lies not in amending the Constitution and further empowering the government, but in relying upon the people to be more discriminating in what they agree to and wiser in what they choose to share with people on the other end of their devices. To paraphrase Shakespeare, perhaps the fault, dear Brutus, lies not in our Constitution, but in ourselves. There are some resources you might want to check, whether you're involved in criminal proceedings or whether you have other legal questions, especially about the laws in Missouri or at the federal level. You can find those at MissouriLawyersHelp.org. That's MissouriLawyersHelp.org. You can find an array of information to help you better understand the law. That's because the more you know about the law, the better decisions you can make for your life, your family, and your finances. Nothing further, Your Honor. You've been listening to Is It Legal 2, a regular look at our legal system and you. It's a special production of the Missouri Bar. I'm Bob Pretty. And I'm Farah Fight. Thanks for being with us. Opinions and positions stated by guests and presenters in the Is It Legal 2 podcast are those of the guests and presenters and not necessarily those of the Missouri Bar. This program is intended as information for lawyers and citizens of Missouri in conjunction with other research they deem necessary in the exercise of their independent judgment.